Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak to you this morning. I'm privileged to speak alongside those with such experience and expertise. Thank you, Malcolm, for the kind introduction, and I won't repeat the acronym. NOPSEMA is an independent statutory authority with responsibility for regulating safety, well integrity, and environmental management of the offshore industry in Australia. As CEO, I report to the Minister, the Federal Minister for Resources and Energy, and I lead a team of about 120 people spanning the west and east coast of Australia. We're actually headquartered in Perth and also have a small office in Melbourne. And I travelled from my home in Perth to be part of this important event for three reasons. To share with you how the governments of Australia and its regulators have learned from the experiences here in the North Sea and from the Piper Alpha disaster. To explain how we've implemented key recommendations from Lord Cullen's report and to say thank you for this contribution arising from the Piper legacy. I will also take the opportunity to reflect on some of the lessons and themes from a regulator's perspective with a view to posing some challenges for us all. As we move forward to define the offshore petroleum industry as one that is safe for people, the environment, and in addition to bringing economic benefit to the communities in which we operate. And over the last two days, much has been spoken about Lord Cullen's report that called for widespread change in the UK industry and also set in train changes internationally. For us in Australia, key recommendations included the requirement for goal setting regulation, the need for a single regulator to remove confusion and uncertainty about overlapping jurisdiction and potentially conflicting requirements. The importance of an independent regulator. The need for a properly resourced inspectorate employing a critical mass of specialist, and I would say competent, inspectors. And so, in Australia, reading the report, we got to work. To put it in context, things are always a little bit challenging in other jurisdictions. We are a federation with a division of responsibilities amongst the federal government and those eight states and territories that have coastal waters. In 79, before um, Piper Alpha, to shorten a long and complicated story, the, the waters and who regulated them were kind of divvied up, and a department called the Designated Authority managed regulation and administration in the, the waters of the corresponding state and territory. And they did everything. Petroleum acreage release, permit allocation, offshore activity promotion, sometimes major project facilitation, as well as safety, wells, and environmental management regulation. So following the Cullen legislation, legislation was amended to introduce the concept of duty of care, clarify responsibilities between the regulator and the operator, and those concepts are, hold true today, and we made further progress in 96 with changes in legislation to provide a firm legal basis for a safety case for all offshore petroleum facilities. So by 96, we had goal setting and the associated safety case processes. But the Australian government recognised that more might be needed to achieve an effective regime. And in 99, it commissioned the review of offshore safety to address its concerns. And in 2001, the review reported that the Australian legal and administrative framework, I could summarise it as saying a dog's breakfast, but there's better words, for the regulation of health safety in the offshore industry is complicated and insufficient to ensure appropriate, effective and cost-effective regulation for the industry. And it recommended a National Petroleum Safety Authority. So all of the ministers had to agree and they got together and in 2002 endorsed the safety case approach and agreed to the formation of an independent national offshore safety authority, backed it up with new laws stipulating the duty of operators to manage offshore petroleum safety and the risk to workforce, and 
also provided laws that we could be funded by cost recovery from the industry re we regulated. So with the establishment and commencement of NOPSA in 2005, we'd implemented the four key recommendations from Lord Cullen's report. We had a goal-setting regulation, and with it the need for operators to submit a safety case to the regulator for challenge. A single regulator for Commonwealth and coastal waters, an independent regulator, and a properly resourced and skilled inspectorate funded by industry levies. And at this time, and in this setting, I must again thank our international counterparts, in particular the United Kingdom and Norway, who assisted with our establishment by sharing their expertise and experiences and the development of our processes, policies and procedures. We begged, stealed and borrowed from wherever we could find good ideas. But we must also thank industry and regulators in the North Sea, particularly here in the UK, where many of our specialists develop their knowledge and expertise. So if you walk around our office, you will be familiar with the accents and many of you will know some of our inspectors. This knowledge and experience and expertise of those now working with us in Australia is a formidable and valuable legacy of Piper Alpha and the Cullen Inquiry. And today, the authority I head, known as NOPSEMA, is a specialist regulator focused only on offshore petroleum operations, but more recently we have greenhouse gas storage activities offshore, but let me assure you there's not many of them yet. So we made a lot of progress quickly, but it turns out it wasn't enough. Major accidents in Australia and internationally, unfortunately, became the catalyst for further change. On the 3rd of June, 2008, a high-pressure 12-inch export sales gas pipeline ruptured and exploded on the beach of Varanus Island off the coast of Western Australia. The pipeline had been weakened by a section of external corrosion. The sort of story is a bit familiar in some ways. Another parallel pipeline ruptured soon after, directing fires towards the onshore processing plant and causing several associated lines also to rupture and ignite. Fortunately, no one was hurt. But if you cut through the expletives on the, it must have been taken on someone's phone, and circulated by email shortly afterwards through the industry, so I guess the unofficial incident report, it was clear that had circumstances been only slightly different, the outcome could have been very different. And as it was, in addition to the loss of export revenue, the resulting damage and plant closure reduced WA's gas supply by almost one third for two months, which had catastrophic effects on a number of businesses, large and small. The inquiry into Varanus Island, and this sounds very familiar, reinforced both the technical requirements for actively implementing plans and managing facility integrity, and also highlighted the potential for confusion at the point where different jurisdictions meet. The report also illustrated the risk where regulatory responsibilities are not clear or where regulators do not exercise their powers consistently and impartially. And then, on the 21st of August 2009, failure of well integrity barriers at the PTTP Montara H1 well in the Timor Sea, North Australia, set off a chain of events that became our industry's most significant incident in decades. The oil spill and the gas leak lasted 74 days until the well and well bore were successfully capped. Ultimately, on the 3rd of November, just before the relief well um, um, killed the well, a fire destroyed the wellhead platform and the West Atlas jack-up drill rig. Remarkably, during the evacuation and so on at the time of the initial blowout in August, no one was killed, there were no industry injuries but had circumstances been only very slightly different, and we're talking the wind in a slightly different direction or a slightly different wind speed, the results could have been catastrophic. 
And then as other speakers have talked about, we saw the, the Macondo disaster in April 2010 that claimed 11 lives. So once again, the spotlight was focused on the high hazards of the offshore oil and gas industry and further provided an impetus for change in Australia and sparked moves for further regulatory reform. Inquiries into Montara also highlighted a number of operator design and regulatory failures, including questions around the resourcing capability of the then regulator of, that, of well integrity, the Northern Territory Designated Authority, to adequately monitor well operations in its jurisdiction and enforce compliance. And you may recall the words of Cullen about the importance of a single well-resourced competent regulator with a critical mass of expertise. These conclusions were pertinent to the events that led to the major offshore incidents of Varanus Island, Montara and Macondo. So the Commission of Inquiry recommended a single body with a long name, the National Offshore Petroleum Safety and Environment Management Authority, so that's what NOPSA became NOPSEMA on the 1st of January 2012. And with its formation, we took a, a step forwards, recognising that the integrity of a well is inextricably linked with the safety of the offshore workforce. And furthermore, that many of the barriers that prevent harm to people also prevent damage to the environment. But I have to say, at the same time, we still took a step backwards, away from the vision of a single national independent regulator, enabling industry to focus on just one set of requirements. Coastal waters are now not all necessarily in Noxema's remit. So we do have a way to go before you can stand on any beach in Australia and look out to sea and be confident that all petroleum activities, wherever you stand, are regulated by, by one entity with the same goals and proper resources. I'll just highlight briefly some key attributes of, of NOPSEMA, and you'll recognise some of the parallels with the, the HSC and the Offshore Safety Division, now the Energy Division here in the UK. We do have similar requirements under our legislation for workforce involvement, and we've had conversations with Step Change about the potential of exporting some of your ideas into the way we do things in Australia, because I think we have a lot to learn. We are funded through industry levies, and that enables us to attempt to remunerate our inspectors well. Um, we're not tied by quite the same um, public service constraints as some, some others. We are a performance-based regime, and we apply a consistent performance-based approach across all elements of our regulatory responsibilities for health, safety, well integrity, and environment management. We do have some prescriptive elements. Um, for the control of some risks, such as minimum standards for noise, certain hazardous substances, or things like the oil content to produce formation water discharge to the environment. And our focus from our inception in 2005 has been on major accident events. And we focus on it from a consequence basis, meaning that we must be vigilant and rigorous in our delivery if there's a high consequence event, no matter what its likelihood. And we must plan for what might happen should all the prevention barriers fail. And that's the starting point in our regulatory thinking as we assess the, the key documents, the safety case, the well operations management plan or the environment plan. Our focus on safety has remained through all of our regulatory evolutions. But from my experience, one of the ongoing challenges for those with a health, safety and environment management role, both in industry as a regulator, is how to strike a balance in resource allocation 
between often acute and immediate issues around safety and the chronic, often longer term issues around environment. And I believe a focus on major accident event prevention reduces this tension. There is a strong link between safety and environmental outcomes as recognised in the establishment of NOTSEMA as a single regulator. Many of the actions and controls necessary to ensure the safety of people, like blowout prevention for example, are equally effective at protecting the environment. Um, but we have to, as safety regulators and having safety in our hearts, we also have to be realistic. If we look at the media reports of Macondo, 11 men died and others were injured. And while their deaths were reported early on, the majority of the images and the enduring story in the media was about the environmental and the community impact. And that also, that experience demonstrates the value of planning and designing and delivering risk management that considers the impact on both lives and the environment but does not, of course, cancel out the need to take seriously those aspects of planning that exist primarily to protect the environment. So those are some of the lessons from Piper and the Cullen Report that we in Australia have learnt and the significant contribution that they've given to us. And I would be grateful if you indulge me while I share some of my um, reflections on the challenges I see ahead for regulators and industry. As a regulator, I ask myself, are we effective? Have we made a difference? And how do we know this? What is the evidence? And if we are effective, exactly what elements of the regime are most crucial? Is it the goal-setting regulation? and with it the need for safety cases covering all aspects of operation? Is it that we're a single regulator and attempt for clarity of what we're doing? Is it an independent regulator? Or is it about a properly resourced inspectorate employing a critical mass of specialist competent inspectors? Or are these characteristics interconnected or inseparable so as Andrew Hopkins and Sir Hannan Cave highlighted, in governments can't really pick and choose the aspects they want and ignore or marginalise others and expect to deliver a consistent outcome. Independence, well-resourced and competent and a clear mandate are all essential for a performance-based regime to work. And if you start picking and choosing too much, I believe that there will be challenges, and I think you can see that in the way that NOPSEMA was built up step by step. And whilst I believe that the insights on regulation from Lord Cullen's report are as relevant for regulators today as they were 25 years ago, I am actually still troubled. Is there something we are missing? What more should we consider? What will leading edge regulation and regulators in the offshore oil and gas industry need to do their job effectively in 25 years' time. And inextricably linked to these quandaries is the question, exactly what is it that we regulators do that contributes the most to the reduction of risk and the creation by industry of safe places to work? If we can answer this, we can then apply our effort and our resources where it'll have the most impact. So is it when your regulator challenges you during an assessment process? When we ask you in industry, are you doing enough to manage risk to be as low as reasonably practical? Or is the most important thing we do when we follow up during inspections when we ask you to provide evidence that you are in fact doing what you committed to do in your safety case. And for us in NOPSEMA, this is a lot more than simple checklists where we see whether something's absent or present, where, whether a test or an activity has taken place or not. It's a lot more than that. And we strive to probe whether systems and processes are present and functioning as intended. 
Or is the most important thing we do when we investigate, when things go wrong, when we carry out enforcement actions? Or is it our stakeholder engagement, such as the promotion of safety and risk management or sharing of lessons learned? Or perhaps, as one of Nopsema's very experienced inspectors said to me last week, the most important thing we do is to be here. Whilst I agree with him in part, I think it is more than just being here that makes a difference. It's also about asking questions and actually having the knowledge and the skills to know the most pertinent and challenging questions to ask and to understand the answer. And most importantly of all, to take action if the answer is insufficient or unsatisfactory. And this brings me to one of the key challenges faced by NOPSEMA and many, if not all, of the regulators of the offshore industry. And I respectfully suggest much of industry itself. And it takes us back again to one of Lord Cullen's key recommendations, resourcing and skill. At NOPSEMA, we believe it's essential for inspectors to understand industry in order to be able to effectively regulate. Our approach to regulation relies on recruiting, developing and engaging sufficient capable inspectors to deal with the diversity and complexity of the Australian industry. And Miranda, um, following me from our industry association, will talk more about the Australian offshore industry and its diversity and complexity. Securing a team of skilled professionals to deliver NOPSEMA's core regulatory functions involves a strategy that combines not just money and conditions, although they help, um, but seeks to navigate the complexities and confines of workforce dynamics and demographics and why people want to work for a regulator. Um, because we believe if we're going to challenge the best and brightest that industry can employ, we need to make sure that we hire and motivate competent, capable people. I will also, in the, in the sort of topic of resourcing, ask a question, can we outsource regulation? I know post Macondo, there was much weight given to the concept of independent well-examination. In my mind, it absolutely has its place but it's simply one of a number of mechanisms an operator may use to verify that its own systems are in place and functioning properly. In my mind, it's not a replacement for strong, capable regulator scrutiny. When we think about independence, never forget the golden rule. He who has the, rule, the gold makes the rules. And independent, well-examined, examiners fundamentally also want to make a living. So the, the other sort of challenge around um, resourcing is what happens in the longer term if regulators are unable to recruit or otherwise obtain the expertise they need to be effective. I believe there will be consequences one consequence is the loss of respect from those we regulate and our governments and communities. And that's a vicious circle. It makes it harder to recruit good people and obtain resources. And we lead to a cycle of further erosion of respect and the ultimate demise, restructure, replacement of the regulator, usually prompted by some significant major accident event with consequences for people or the environment. I think we've heard that story before before. It's not intentional. It's, you know, if we take the eye off the ball about the quality of your people and what they're doing and how they're doing it, it is a risk. Um, I also think if we can't get the right people into our organisations as regulators, we have a continual challenge to a performance-based model where we are challenging you, the operator. Um, because it's easier to deal, it's easier to have a rules-based prescriptive approach, lots of checklists and a checkbox approach. Exercising judgment requires expertise, knowledge, peer group, capability and a variety of other things. And it, some of my folks on a bad day say, can't we just have checklists? And we say, no, 
we actually need to challenge and ask the difficult questions and exercise judgment as whether the case has been made. Nopsema, moving now to um, a second critical challenge for, for regulators, independence. We view independence as critical to regulatory decision making. We make decisions in accordance with the legislation regulation which inform our policies and they can involve in response to the experiences and performance of the industry. We would be very uncomfortable if we were asked to take into account extraneous factors or in the case of assessments, prompted to imagine what an operator planned to do in a particular circumstance, we look for evidence. So I describe independence as the ability to take decisions in accordance with the rules on the basis of the evidence in front of us and have our jobs in the morning. And if any of those three elements weaken, um, we stop being independent. And our challenge, as we have more and more demands on us to do more and more things, is not to allow all of these demands, and it can be anything from the Department of Immigration wanting us to check visa status of offshore workers, simple answer, no, um, is not to allow all of these requests or um, extensive engagement activities or change to distract us from our core functions or divert our limited resources to keeping others happy rather than keeping our eye on the ball. So having spent some time focusing on the regulator, I now want to swing the spotlight on to industry performance. And my views on the degree to which Piper Alpha is imbued um, offshore petroleum industry with a, a clear appreciation of the lessons of that event 25 years ago. So unfortunately, whilst I acknowledge there has been significant progress in understanding risk and in taking steps to manage the risks imposed by the industry, I remain uneasy based on some of our encounters that there's a little bit of a, um, I guess, weak signals that some organisations or some individuals in some organisations may have an approach to the contrary where there is too much focus on the document, be it the safety case or the environment plan, and getting it through NOPSEMA, I begin to worry that the unrelenting systematic focus on reducing risk to their workforce and their environment is being lost on the focus on the document and the hurdle they have to get through. So I, I think as speakers before me have summarised and highlighted, much work remains for industries and regulators alike. Industry around the world continues to experience incidents which cause loss of life, damage to the environment and loss of trust by governments and communities. We continue to see catastrophic failures following similar patterns. Accidents continue to occur as we in, in Australia experienced in August last year. Two men lost their lives on the drill floor of the Stena Clyde. And only last Friday, our colleagues in the Dutch sector experienced a tragic accident which also left two men dead and one injured. There is still much to be done. So while industry may have changed, some elements may have improved, some things have not changed or perhaps not changed enough. To give some examples, there is still there is no comprehensive international incident database at the time of Piper Alpha or now. There is no comprehensive international database or networking mechanism for safety alerts then or now. There's lots of organisations sharing high potentials, sharing incidents, sharing accidents, but it's all done within the, the little silo and there isn't one place where you can go and search for whatever it is and it throws up 
um, a whole range of, of incidents and lessons shown, lessons learned. Standards development was disjointed 25 years ago and remains so today. Is that what we really want? And I could probably go on. But regardless of this, I think there's some clear priorities for future effort by industry, which are in the control of individual companies, individual managers, supervisors, and workers. And this is our opinion in, in NOPSEMA, based on recent inspection findings, incident accident data, and extensive discussion amongst our inspectors and regulatory inspectors, specialists. Technical controls. How do you know, as managers and senior managers, that your technical controls are actually in place and functioning as intended? For example, what steps have you taken to verify that your well barrier policy, your own company policy, is in place and actually applied? Do you have emergency plans, including oil spill contingency plans that you intend to implement? So when you're calling on others to do certain things, are they aware of that? Do they have the capability to do it? Are they prepared to do it for you? Do not wait for your regulator to inspect. Make sure that your own systems, particularly your audits, are effective. So you can pick up your own defects and not wait for us and the HSC and all the other regulators. Management of change, often cited as a contributing factor in investigations. Major change seems to be managed better than small incremental change. What is the situational awareness of your teams to incremental change? Each little change on its own may not move things out of their envelope, but three or four together might, might change things dramatically. Standards. As a regulator in a performance-based regime, standards are critical, particularly acceptance standards for risk, for safety risk. Clear standards are also needed for environmental performance. And asset integrity. Like the North Sea, Australia has aging facilities as well as an aging workforce, and it's important that integrity is monitored and managed so our assets are fit for their intended function. We would like to see much greater emphasis placed on truly understanding and verifying the actual condition for today's activities and those planned in the future. But looking forwards, we would like to see much greater emphasis placed on the ability to monitor and manage integrity from the design phase. Um, the more we think about the ageing of the facility at the point of design and make it easy to monitor, um, bits of pipeline that you can't put a pick through is not really a good idea because then you run the risk of claiming that the asset has integrity simply because there's not been a problem, because no one has looked to see whether it's got integrity. So in closing, the pipe rail for disaster and inquiry and recommendations by Lord Cullen have had a huge impact in Australia. No company or regulator around the world that I'm aware of has disputed the messages. And some, like Australia, have embraced the recommendations and to date had success implementing the improvements. Regrettably, in some places, others have still not bought in. But I recognise entrenched industry and regulatory culture is difficult to change, even when faced by clear evidence of the need to improve the human and organisational aspects of safety programmes. There is usually resistance to change, even when there's a clear opportunity to refocus, in our case, our regulatory programmes, to emphasise the role of human and organisational influences on offshore safety. Unfortunately, absent major incidents such as Piper Alpha and more recently Montara and Macondo, there is little appetite for improvement in the change in details. But I do believe in the last three years there has been a step change that gives me cause for optimism. 
Around the globe, companies, even the very largest, are realizing they cannot do this alone. As they realize they will be judged by the performance of the weakest player in the industry. And the industry in its totality, ability to access areas to explore and development, find favorable fiscal regimes, get ongoing support from governments and communities, and perhaps most importantly, the industry's ability to attract the best and brightest people is severely limited when things go wrong. The level of communication and collaboration and sharing that we've seen across the industry since Macondo has been unprecedented. And I think this is in part a recognition that we are in a global industry. We have mobile equipment, mobile people, and the reality is what we have in common around the globe is much greater than our differences. So industry and regulators alike must work to minimize local nuances, to use as much common language, common framework, common approaches as we possibly can, and seek to have key understanding, common understanding of key concepts. We all basically know the key principles behind, um, say, a permit to work. We went out and asked people in Australia what safety culture meant to them, and we got a diversity of views. We still have a way to go. So wherever possible, we should use what works well elsewhere and seek to argue that risk will be reduced if rather than modifying and growing our own and reinventing the wheel, that we take what works well somewhere else and use it. And this applies equally to regulators as well as industry. And the International Regulators Forum, I have to do some marketing, will be holding a conference in Perth in October to share insights, learnings, and best practice between regulators and also with, within the industry. And we will also hold our Regulators Forum AGM where we will discuss priorities for the future. So whilst there is general public acceptance that the activities associated with the offshore petroleum industry carry inherent risks. There is also the reasonable expectation that these risks are effectively managed. Events surrounding Piper Alpha and more recent events, such as the Montara and Macondo incidents, have raised public expectations of industry and government accountability and intensified the level of scrutiny applied to the industry and its regulation. But I would remind us all, without effective risk management by industry every day, supported by strong regulatory scrutiny, Piper Alpha could absolutely happen again. And I encourage those leading the offshore petroleum industry into the next generation to move major accident prevention up the list of priorities so safety and environmental management are treated with the same degree of seriousness as profit and loss. Thank you. <laughs>